listeners, uh, welcome back to part two of our John Carpenter episode. So once again, me and Devin like to pontificate, uh, like to hear the sounds of our own voices, apparently. And then we introduce Casey to the mix. So that's three people uh, that can't stop talking about John Carpenter. So we unfortunately, as we should have probably expected, we did have to break this up into a two-parter. So if you are listening to this, you are listening to the start of the part two of our John Carpenter episode. So you will sort of just hear us mid-conversation. Uh, so, uh, obviously, if you're listening to this one first, go back and listen to the first episode. Otherwise, uh, I don't know where Devin will be editing this into. Uh, but, uh, yeah, um, uh, with me again is Devin and Casey. Hey uh, Devin, Casey, did you want to intro- say hi before we let them into uh, part two? Hello, I'm Casey. <laughs> Vital information. <laughs> um, but yeah, guys, so thanks for listening. Uh, hopefully you guys enjoy part two. Hopefully you enjoyed part one. If you didn't, if you're not listening to this, it's because uh, I'm assuming you didn't like part one. Fair enough. But uh, have fun. And again, happy Halloween. Here's part two. Now, moving on to something else here before we get into some of the really big hitters. I I do think we're doing a disservice if we don't mention Memoirs of an Invisible Man. Not because it's it's Carpenter's least favorite of his works. Uh, He he claims his favorite thing to work on was Assault on Precinct 13. But you can tell when he, by the way, he talks about it. There's one that definitely his heart belongs to more. But the fact remains that neither of those movies are Memoirs of an Invisible Man. (laughs) Which... Started off, by the way, this this is what makes a lot of sense to me. And I, the way that I think the movie could have actually have been successful is if the original director and its star could have gotten yep. along a little bit better. Uh, it was meant to be an Ivan Reitman film, and it feels like an Ivan Reitman film. And John Carpenter doesn't even put his name above it uh, because right. it's essentially an Ivan Reitman film. It's definitely a work for hire, for sure, as far as Carpenter goes. Uh, what are your memories of that one, Casey? Did you, did you see that theatrically? or I did, see, games? I did see it theatrically. It was a little bit before that, actually. I remember seeing it, and I was like, oh, that's a cool movie. But what really stuck out with me is, I, you know, not, this didn't really have anything to do with Carpenter. But I remember the being really impressed with the effects of that movie. Like, yeah. I, I thought the effects for that movie were pretty groundbreaking for when it came out. I mean, whether, whether you think they still hold up or not. It's like, like T2. When you see that the first effects run, don't hold like, up wow, in they... T2 anymore, but the, in the moment. Yeah, it's just like, but in the moment, you're just like, man, they fucking must have worked their ass off to pull this shit off. Yeah. And um, I don't mind the story. I don't mind what's going on in it. I think it's an entertaining movie. I see why people don't like it. It's especially John Carpenter <laughs> after all the stories you hear about him and Chevy Chase not getting along. Yeah, I've got some but quotes here. <laughs> I think I think within... <laughs> Like the situation of it being made, I don't think is as bad as people say. It's obviously, it's definitely on the lower spectrum of Carpenter films. It's almost not a Carpenter film. I mean, it, it's pretty much a work for hire. It's it, John it Carpenter's Vampire him, in Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah, it's basically. <laughs> That's him, a good analogy. It's basically him experience for himself everything that he already knew about working with big studios that he, you know, unless they're letting him untethered do his own thing. Like you probably just should not be doing the project, yeah. <laughs> like because he was he was very much an auteur at this point, and so just to have him, you know, kind of do this thing where he really has no control of the fucking studios, like you know, giving him notes and limiting him left and right, his fucking main star is a pain in the ass. It's it's basically just one of the harshest lessons he learned. But I don't think it's a total loss of a movie, you know, whether you think you know. I agree. I, I think whether you think. Car- Carpenter being a part of it brought anything to it or not. But it's just one of those movies that, like, if it comes on in the background, I I, I would watch. Like, it's there's there's some fun stuff going on in it that, that I tend to give it more pass than I think more people would. Yeah, and so. I think you're right, too. I, I think most people, if this was not a John Carpenter film with John Carpenter expectations on it, I would have been much yeah. more better received. If it was from the director of Ghostbusters, just, uh, again, on that same level this would have been a a much funner project to watch because the expectations would have been different totally james do you have any thoughts on memoirs of an invisible man any memories of of when this came out in 92 i can tell you honestly i remember because as a kid i was a giant chevy chase fan and i swear to god i remember we I, i think my mom rented it or my older brother rented it and I remember watching it being like, oh, this is the death of Chevy Chase's career. Like, <laughs> you know, at that point he made like, a, a, this was after Funny Farm, but it was when he was really just like 
making dog shit movies. And I was like, this goodbye, Chevy Chase. Era, yeah. Yeah. Which is, again, a movie that he ruined because he couldn't get along with the director, which how do you not get along with fucking Dan Aykroyd? I mean, I can, I, if we're being honest, I can see not getting along with John Carpenter. John Carpenter is kind of a prickly dude, but, but also, but let's not, it's all Chevy Chase's fault. We all know Chevy Chase was a piece of shit human being. Uh, so, but anyways. And also Chevy Chase is kind of playing more of a straight man in this, which, yeah. you know, Why wasn't cast, really, that wasn't yeah. really his thing. Yeah. And so I can see that, you know, putting people off as well, like justifiably so, but it, you know, it's not a movie I've like, oh my God, I've seen that so many times. I've probably seen this movie like four or five times in my lifetime. Which yeah. Is probably four more times than most people have. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I literally, this movie came out in 92. I haven't seen it since 1990, maybe three when they went to rental or whatever. But <laughs> yeah, but like, I, it's always a movie that like, if it came on HBO, I would still find myself watching for whatever reason. And, um, but yeah, in hindsight, when you really like get analytical about it, it's like, there's just so many no's that happened with this movie that, <laughs> you know, the fact that I can still find entertainment in it is kind of amazing, but I know that's not the case for most people. So it's can I just, just go on record as saying Daryl Hannah has probably in the top three least favorite voices of any. <laughs> at, like it works if you're a replicant, and it works as if you're a mermaid, but those are the only times that voice works. So <laughs> please stop talking. Anyways. I was just gonna. You you went ahead and made the splash reference. I was gonna say, are you referring to her original language of mermaid? <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather hear that. <laughs> well, while we're on these actors, uh, I, I think the a fitting way to close this, uh, because I, I think what we're all getting around saying is that Memoirs of an Invisible Man is a good movie with shitty actors. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Carpenter went on record as calling Chase a quote a director's worst nightmare and nearly impossible to direct. Uh, apparently Chase would rip off parts of his costume while they were filming because he had to wear blue screen type stuff and nylons yep. on his face. And, and uh, Carpenter apparently was usually known to be very cool on the set. He broke a clipboard in half over his knee. <laughs> so that Chevy Chase had taken off his, his makeup again and then said again, I quote, and this is about both Chase and Daryl Hannah. Chase and Daryl Hannah were immune to any punishment from the studio, and they knew it. So they walked over me and everyone else on the set and essentially told us we'd be replaced if we had a problem with them. It was like working with your boss's snooty children who would tattle on you if you didn't bend on their every will. And I'll be goddamn if that doesn't sound exactly like just about everything that everybody says about Chevy Chase first. Uh, yeah, I love Fletch as much as the next guy and Clark W. Griswold is still... I say, say, he was my hero! Fathers. Yes. Yeah. But, yeah, shame that you know, I, I don't know whether he had a coke problem or something. I, there were a lot of actors during that time who I think were getting bad reputations because of drug habits. But I, I think that I, I'm sure Chase was familiar with Blow. Uh, but I don't. I, I think Blow had a Chevy Chase habit. Exactly. <laughs> but, but also, I mean, he, also, he was an asshole in this in on SNL. Like right. he was a he thought he was a good looking dude. He came from money. He he had a rampant ego anyway. So. Take a, a normal dickhead like that, and then combine coke and fame in the eighties and seventies. And uh, but he's one of the most heartbreaking like documentaries I've seen about making a film is actually the Nothing But Trouble. Uh, there's a Nothing But Trouble little. I don't know if it's, it's not. It's like a YouTube history of, and it's heartbreaking. Like to hear like the shit he was pulling on the set and basically completely undermining poor Dan Aykroyd. And he's a notorious dick. We all know that. There's a a whole chapter of uh, that SNL book of just people talking shit on Chevy Chase. So. <laughs> <laughs> but also like his, if you look at like Chevy Chase's style of comedy and like the way he delivers stuff it's always very dry and it's always very cynical smart it's, it's, it's always yeah, at somebody very, else's I mean, expense so, so whenever i yeah. hear that like Chevy Chase is an asshole i'm kind of like yeah i see yeah it. exactly it's yeah. Insane. you know it did, well not change me from liking some of his movies yes no. yeah just the thing like thankfully he was able to make movies to where that worked for him yeah. The like, thing is, what he does work for him, but even the though thing he is a too, tremendous pain in the ass to work with. If you look at all of his su most successful like films or the roles, it's because he worked with like his friends or people he had a working career with and trusted, um, and that who let him sort of be the star. So he's an egomaniac, but it's fine. It's, he's it's still fun. Clark Double Griswold and Fletch. So 
And just to show that it's not all sour grapes, John Carpenter did have something kind to say about another member of the cast. He said, uh, basically, he said he couldn't have gotten through Memoirs of an Invisible Man if it hadn't have been working with Sam Neill, who he became very good friends with on the set of that movie. And they decided to work together again on In the Mouth of Madness, which is very much a John Carpenter movie, unlike Memoirs of an Invisible Man. James, I can see you nodding your head there, just waiting to be let loose on this one. What what do you think of In the Mouth of Madness? I think it's brilliant. I think, first off, I will say this. If Sam Neill is in a horror movie, I'm going to go see that movie because he has a 100% track rating with me. He's in a horror movie. That movie's going to be great, whether it's Event Horizon, Possession, In the Mouth of Madness. I And I certainly was never an actor in my childhood. Like, I remember, like, watching Jurassic Park thinking that he was kind of a... He, he seemed like a smug dickhead to me, but in my, you know, then into my adulthood, I'd become a giant fan. But the movie's great. It's taking the mytho- like a, a Lovecrafty mythology, but doing something different with it that works. And um, I, I almost the consider it are the great, the whole good Lovecraft movie, even though it's not based on Lovecraft at all. No, I agree. I agree. In fact, some of the best Lovecraft adaptations aren't even really faithful adaptations. They're sort of taking themes or whatever. I'll, something uh, you had in common with a girl and Poe, like. But I will say this. I love how weird the movie is. Uh, I love how like the sort of it, the movie really keeps you on your toes. You 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 get just as disoriented as the characters in the book. I I think I understand why people didn't like it when it first came out because it is sort of an obtuse film and it is you know. But I think now like it's become just like a lot of. I mean that's sort of the car- story of Carpenter's career a lot. Whether it's the thing or they live or you know films come out and they're not loved at the time but sort of become you know much more beloved. I, one of the things I will say about this movie is that it still boggles my mind to this day that vi- you know. There's been so many people in my life who said like, oh, I love John Carpenter. I'm like, oh, really? Have you seen, or like what, you, what we eventually comes down to In the Mouth of Madness. And they have never, they, and they've seen everything else. They just have never seen this movie. And I'm sure they've never seen uh, the Elvis. <laughs> but anyways, but, <laughs> but just, yeah, it's still even, even amongst his fans, it's not uh, uh, as well known. Although again, I think it's becoming, but yeah, I think it's great. And I, I think Sam Neill is great. His performance is great. I think it's visually a really interesting film. The whole, yeah, anyways, I'm, I'm trying not to pontificate too much. (laughs) Well, I remember seeing this in the theater on opening night because I didn't want anyone to ruin it for me. Uh, My friend and I were going to see it and being very disappointed that we were like the only ones in the theater on opening night. So I, you guys know how this goes. There are some movies... And this was especially true when we were young, but I think since all three of us kind of suffer some form of arrested development, I think it still exists. Uh, The added excitement of getting to have a first preview of a movie at a convention and getting to see like that bonus footage or to, in my case, I got to actually see John Carpenter speak on In the Mouth of Madness. And so I was really, I went into this movie already having a one sheet on my bedroom wall and loved it. Uh, absolutely loved it but being so disappointed that nobody was showing up to this movie that in my world everybody was so excited about (laughs) and uh, especially this was kind of uh, on the waning end of the Stephen King popularity Uh, he said he's got the resurgence going on right now that is certainly well uh, deserved and I I hope that it actually never goes away again because Stephen King is a Nash treasure but (laughs) there was definitely this period of time Stephen King movies were still very much a thing but Stephen King movies were starting to become like the lawnmower man and yes and sleepwalkers yes uh Actually, I, I kind of like Sleepwalkers. I do too. And I, I mean, I, at the time, I actually kind of like Lawnmower Man, but true, not true. his I, most I successful or beloved properties. No, but I, I really appreciated the way that uh, this was. It felt like Stephen King and Lovecraft combined, but with a full John Carpenter stamp on it. So yeah. it, it really felt organically like it belonged to those three men. Uh, and the the performances are fantastic. I. I need to look it up to see it for sure, but I'm pretty sure it's the only other movie I've ever seen uh, Vigo from Ghostbusters 2 in. Uh, That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, True but, stamp of successful cinema. Yes. <laughs> Put Vigo in that shit. <laughs> Which he's a weird looking motherfucker. So, and this is a weird yeah, looking movie. Uh, and I've heard, I, you know, I should look that dude up because I've heard some really insane shit about that guy. <laughs> like he practically was Vigo in real life. He was some sort of tyrant in his home country or something. So it's actually surprising he didn't <laughs> force himself into more movie roles. Uh, but he got this in Ghostbusters too. But anyways, the, the story really is mind bending. And at a younger age, which I, I really think that almost the best age to be watching John Carpenter movies is 
those early teenage years. I, I think that if you miss seeing John Carpenter during that period of time, you might miss John Carpenter entirely. And it's uh, that's not a put down. But for me, seeing that kind of a mind bending story when I was 14, 15 years old really had effect on me and, and on my on my own writing and the things that I wanted to pursue. And the ultra meta ending, and this is a spoiler alert here for anyone that doesn't want to know the ending of In the Mouth of Madness. At the end, Sam Neill ends up walking into a movie theater that is playing the movie In the Mouth of Madness. And there's even a poster for the movie that I wish was the poster for the actual movie. Right? The artwork for the actual movie that I had on my wall back then is actually real lame Photoshoppy type shit. But the poster for the movie within the movie uh, that also says that it was directed by John Carpenter. Uh, the only difference, the, the crew is exactly the same on that poster. The only difference is that instead of uh, Sam Neill, it says the character's name as starring in it. And then he goes in and he watches this movie that's about him, basically. He realizes he's the main character in this movie. And the meta-ness of that and the just... It's not despair, but at the same time, it is despair. At that point, once he sits down to watch himself in a movie, you realize the world is gone. Yeah, <laughs> and he's 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 gone. He's yeah, yeah. He's lost he's, his mind. He's bananas. Yeah, and the world's going to go with it. And this was the final in a uh, trilogy, an unofficial trilogy that Carpenter was making, that also included The Thing, Prince of Darkness, and this. And for that to be the ending of his Apocalypse trilogy, as he called it. Uh, what a what an ending! Uh, it yeah. seems so simple to look at it now. It almost seems cliched, but that shit wasn't cliche. I mean, outside of Blazing Saddles, that shit was not cliche. <laughs> yeah, my experience with this movie. Um... It's funny, it ties into so many things that's been said, but it was actually one of the times I remember being really creeped out seeing a horror movie in a theater. Like, there was just all these weird things going on that night outside <laughs> of the movie. Like, the person I went with, like, got into a car accident, like, in the parking lot of the movie theater before we were about to go in, <laughs> which caused us to be late, and so we had to, like, sit, like, near the front which made the movie even more like intense for us. Yeah, oh, man. Like, we, just, we clearly saw it in different theaters. <laughs> so, so in our face. And so, and the fact, like you said, the one of the other times I remember being that creeped out watching a movie in the theater was Event Horizon, which leads back to Sam Neill. Yeah. So I do think a lot of the reasons why I, I like it is it's funny that you say it's part of the trilo this trilogy that he had is basically for the same reasons I like Prince of Darkness is that it's just extremely weird. Not everything is like explained, like spoon fed, explained to you. You have to be somewhat well read if you're really going to get down to like the brass tacks of everything. Like I'm, I'm not that experienced with like Lovecraft. So it just, it was just this weird ass like thing to me, you know, what was happening in this movie. And um, it's just a generally creepy ass movie and it's, it's really well done. I don't really know what, what else like, <laughs> more I can say about it. I would say this too, and it's not just the Sam Neill thing, but I've watched it a few times with back to back with uh, Event Horizon. And there's even some weird visual things that happen like between the two. I think specifically the Sam Neill, the things that I th immediately think about. Because they both are very unsettling, but also very weird. And you're sort of trying to understand what's happening. I mean, obviously more so with this than Event Horizon, but I just, God damn, man. Like, I, I feel like this era in the 90s when horror was basically dying, especially like the big franchise, the slashers, your, you know, the Freddy's Jason, even the Michael Myers, that the horror films that came out or this time were trying to do something different or were taking more chances. And even though the, the vast majority of horror from this period in the 90s wasn't that great, I think the films that from this era that were trying to do something were extra cool because they were just trying to, they weren't being influenced by what was popular. They were just trying to tell a, a unique story. And, you know, that I can't think of a better example than In the Mouth of Madness. Yeah, for sure. Now, where would you guys place uh, his follow-up to that, which is Village of the Damned? Did you guys go see that in the theater? And uh, this was, as far as my experience, I, I think did this, not. Is, this was kind of when people were starting to notice that Carpenter may be on the decline. And Carpenter yeah, was noticing it, too. He, it's he, the one film I have nothing to say about. Yeah. <laughs> It was a movie I never saw first run. Um, again, it was just when I decided I was going to try to watch as much Carpenter films as possible once, like, Shout Factory st started releasing everything that, like, you know, so I bought it to add to my collection and I watched it. And I'm like, yeah, you know, there's nothing, like, super special to it, but it's not, I didn't think it was necessarily horrible. 
No, it's not horrible. It's it's, but it's very much kind of like a throwaway movie. The but it's something is almost mind numbing, I think, because it's almost good. It's almost really good. The shit where she sticks yeah. her hand in boiling water because the kid's eyes start glowing. Right. Um, that was. I still remember seeing that in the theater and being like, "Oh God, she's gonna do it." My thing is like, it's they might have as well just colorized the like. It's yeah. It doesn't do anything. It, I mean, people make fun of uh, of Gus Van Sant's Psycho remake, rightfully so. But to me, this isn't that far off. Like, why? Like, it didn't. I don't know. I'm seeing them both. You it know, didn't within, add anything to the original story. No, but, it no. just. And, and again, you could tell Carpenter's heart was not. It was. I don't know if it was a paycheck or just. But it was, the movie it was just a feels very ob- obligation. He has actually gone on record obligation. to say that that movie was a contractual obligation. Uh, the thing you could that, definitely feel like it. There, it was uninspired. He just was not inspired making them. Yeah, it was. It was a lot of Kirstie Alley walking around with her weird yellow cigarettes and. Um, <laughs> And I will say uh, on a, a sad note, this was actually the final theatrical feature of Christopher Reeve prior to his accident. Yeah, and yeah, uh, it's too bad. Yeah, it's really too bad. I would have actually have liked to. I wish Christopher Reeve had worked with Carpenter on some other stuff. I could see like like if Reeve had been the part of the Simon and Simon guy in Prince of Darkness, uh, for example. Yeah, I, I think they really could have had. They, they worked well together. Uh, just not the right script. Uh, Mark Hamill is in Village of the Dam too. It's like this incredible cast that you usually only saw in other stuff. <laughs> it's, it's like, hey, you want to see a movie where Superman and uh, Luke, Luke Skywalker, Skywalker and Crocodile Dundee's girlfriend fight a bunch of alien children? Uh, on paper, it sounds like sign me up. But... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I just, it's one of those movies that like, when you finish watching it, it's like, none, it, you just... So, I mean, like I said, there are some few key things. And again, he took the like visuals of the kids and basically was like, I'm not changing anything about this, uh, which I almost applaud because it gives them a very alien, unearthly look. But uh, but yeah, it's just like you you stop watching it and then your brain just doesn't retain any. It just goes on to what else ever you're doing. And it's just, it's just, it's, again, it's not that it's bad. It's just sad how mediocre it is. Yeah. And you know, another thing that makes me feel exactly the same way is John Carpenter's The Ward. If anybody has anything to say about The Ward briefly. We might as well talk about The Ward right now. We might as well. So I was, before I watched it, I was warned, like, this is a, because again, you know, he had made a movie at this point, like in a decade or almost. It was like nine years. Um, nine years, something like that. Yeah. So of course it's like John Carpenter's making another movie. And it's a horror movie. And then. Like a ghost but I, everybody in a mental like, hospital. But everybody's like, dude. And the thing is, it's not a bad movie. First of all, it looks incredible, especially if you compare it with the, the shit he was doing before, as far as like, the, I don't know if it was a, I don't think it had a big budget, but it felt like more like a big budget than it some of production his, value, yeah. The production value was great. I, I personally am not a big fan of Amber Heard. Like, I just don't get it. But I like, don't like she's not her. bad, but I, I, I did, yeah, I don't I, she, it has nothing to do with, what, with what's going on between her and Johnny Depp. I don't, that is going to go down as the most confusing case yes. of cancellation, of career cancellation. Yeah. I, I don't, I, I'm frankly, I, I want to believe Johnny Depp's not a piece of shit, but I can totally believe that he's a piece of shit. Well, but I mean, the, the thing time, is now, everybody's come out and said that she was actually the, there's like, it just, I don't know, there's a lot of losers. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Let's not even get into, but yeah, but outside, even be that. I she's just I, for there's something about like blandly pretty blonde women that like Blake Lively. I just don't, I don't connect with. Like, I just don't care. Like, she and she's not good Blake Lively stuff. Uh, I just she's not my. I've just nothing, never liked Amber Heard. Yeah, Shallow? I'm just not a fan. But yeah, the the movie is Shallow. just bland. Is the only. I mean, it's literally like. I was like, well, that well, that was a th- that happened. Like, and it's not bad. The, the I forget the actor's name. Uh, Peter Schner. Are you thinking of uh, God, Jared Danny. Harris? Who's the guy? What's up? Is it Jared Harris? Well, He's Richard Harris. You son. might be right. For some reason, I thought you had a different name. Guy was on Mad Men right here. Yes, yeah. and I just really like him. It is Jared Harris, huh? Why well, I, I felt like he had a more sophisticated name than that. But um, he's but, also in the movie uh, Notorious Betty Page, and I really I don't know, I just like him as an actor. He's very unique he's looking. Chernobyl, very, by the way, unique. which is one of my favorite things in the last year or two. Like, I I need to watch it. I know I haven't it watched affected it yet. me very deeply. Yes, and I actually uh, I took a I went inside a uh, Screen Actors Guild course on how to write true stories that was taught by Craig Mazin, writer and showrunner of Chernobyl, and that was incredible just to be in the room with with that dude. Uh, but anyways, that's, that's awesome. beside the point. Jared Harris is a creepy doctor in this movie, and I, his performance is fine. I wish the script gave him more to do. He's a, a yeah, incredibly exactly. talented actor. But that, that, that's the thing is like the, all there's like talented actors in it. Like Daniel Panabaker, I usually really like from Sky High. Same, same, same. 
Same. That's. It, I but can't remember the name of the actress from Kick Ass that was in it. Uh, I'll never remember her name. But the love interest from Kick Ass. Oh, Chloe Moretz. No, 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 not uh, not Hit Girl. It was uh, Lindsay. The one, the one that Kick Ass was actually in love with. That was he was trying to impress her by being a superhero. Uh, Lindsay Fonic, F- Fonseca. Something like that. Okay. But yeah, she's in this, and I. I <laughs> that's her name. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's that's her name. The performers are are really pretty fine. Even Amber Heard, I'm giving her it, shit, but she wasn't horrible. Yeah, yeah, she's not horrible. Like I said, I just don't have any connection. I just I find her very bland and forgettable. But but yeah, the, the movie. It's not like you don't watch it. Go, oh, that was awful. It's just it's nothing. It's like it's one of the most just. It's I don't know, and that's why it's so heartbreaking because you expect it. He had, he had all the tool. He had decent actors. He had an interesting concept, kind of. I, I mean, to me, the concept is very like you it know. Was, it was a, a twist ending, and uh, I won't give away the twist ending in case anybody does want to see the ward because that's a newer movie. So I actually uh, haven't seen it. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm not going to give it away for Casey. Uh, I'll get around to it someday. <laughs> generally speaking, my my rule is if it's been more than 20 years, you've had plenty of time to see the ending, but. This movie's a little bit newer than that, but it does have a twist ending. And the twist ending is definitely kind of a, a yawner. Mm. It's it's not anything that you haven't seen before, which is what's really disappointing about it. I, I don't understand. It did not have a high enough budget to feel like a paycheck movie, but at the same time, there wasn't enough to this script to yep. be able to figure out what about it brought well, John Carpenter be. out of retirement nine years after his previous right. Yeah. Here, here's the thing, though. It feels like a John Carpenter movie, though. There's so many. Like, it has a vibe, like the well, way it's, it's like it's a slasher movie. Uh, it's just the slasher is a ghost. Yeah, but it, like the, it looks like a John Carpenter movie. Like it, it has the vibe of a John Carpenter movie. But it, it's the weirdest thing. It just, it's very sad that that's like the last movie he'll probably ever direct because you know for obvious reasons. But uh, yeah, I mean. You should, everybody should see it if you're a Darren Governor fan. But, and again, that's not to say it's like so terrible that it's unforgivable. The unforgivable part is just how mediocre it is. It, it could have been, uh, yeah, it's like you said, there's just, I, yeah, I don't know what you said it perfectly. Like, it's not a, like a paycheck movie, but at the same time, there's nothing unique enough that why did you choose this to, co- I don't, it's weird, but yeah. All right. Now, what he's coming back from nine years prior to this, let's go ahead and since we're in the mode of getting a few things out of the way, I know that James is the only person I know that loves this movie, and that is The Ghost of Mars. Yeah, well, I mean, love might be a stretch, <laughs> but okay, look, is it a perfect movie? No. I mean, the cast is dog shit. I mean, Jesus Christ, like, <laughs> first off, I mean, the, 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 the it, this was supposed to be a third St. Pliskin movie. It was supposed yes. to be Escape a from St- Mars. Escape from Mars, exactly, which, fuck yeah, let's do that. Especially, you know, I don't know, man, the movie's very weird. It's, the cast is bad. Like, the cast is bad. Jason Statham wasn't really, I mean, he was supposed to be the star, but he wasn't a big enough. Well, they wanted you know. him for Desolation Williams. Desolation yes. Williams is the character that replaced the Snake Plissken character. Exactly. And in this, he only comes in like half an hour, 40 minutes into the storytelling, but I'm sure had it been a Snake Plissken story, it would have had a completely yeah. different first act. Uh, and I, you know, I know there's a lot of people. Statham was hired yeah. to play him. And I'm sorry, I, I, I have nothing against, uh, nothing against him. Uh, against I- Ice uh, Cube, uh, he's been decent acting in some things. He's awful, like he's so bad. It's so everything. Every time he says anything, it's so eye rolly. He's just trying so hard. He actually hates him. this movie too. I- Ice he Cube should. says this is the worst movie he's ever made. Uh, but he puts it on Carpenter's. He says Carpenter let us down, and he says the special effects looked like they were from 1979, which he's exactly right. It's model work. It, it actually in 2020 is one of the few things that I enjoy about Ghosts of Mars is that I like the model work to make Mars look like it's actually got trains running on it. Yeah, we'll get to the like the effects and stuff too in a second. But f- my biggest thing is, uh, you know what I was saying about earlier about uh, vaguely attractive blonde ladies? Uh, nobody <laughs> sums that more up than Natasha Hendridge. I still don't understand her film career either. Uh, she has the charisma of a fucking black hole. <laughs> Like she's also a bad actress, and like, and then you you put poor Pam Greer in this movie, which is zero for two with John Carpenter movies. Yeah, uh, just I mean, a, like an afterthought. Like just, but there's the movie makes no sense in lots of ways. Like it's a, they, it's like this. It's, there's a lot of plot holes. I, I know I'm supposed to be defending this movie, but <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's not a great movie. There's it, there's so much of it. It feels like a first draft. First off, it's yeah. like this. It, 
it's like, and okay, let me talk about what I do like about it. So first off, I know a lot of people hate the whole, you know, it opens with like the survivors of the train, you know, and you know, you, you, it she's starts her, at the end and, kind yes. of, and then tells the story. And uh, yeah, I thought that was used. cool. Yeah, it, it's not. It's classic. It's, it's not original. It's, it's Citizen Kane. It, you started exactly. The end. Yeah, and I think there's always. If, I always, my assumption is always if you're going to do that, do it that way. The ride's going to be crazy if you're going to sort of spoil the whole. And also, people act like they've never seen a fucking movie before. Like, oh, so we know who survives. Yeah, you always know who survives. Watch Nightmare on Elm Street. Tell me who survives. Like, I mean, give me a break. <laughs> but, but like, the first thing I'll say about it is those the quote unquote ghosts of Mars scare the shit out of me. They were creepy. The, looking. That sequence when they introduce them and they're like. Dude, it freaks me out. And I mean, there's a weird, like, sort of like the height of body modification culture. And it's sort of like there's an element of that in there, which is a little eye rolly. And, uh, you know, it, it definitely is an edgelord aspect to it. But first off, the, the main villain, the main, like, the head of that tribe, I think he's terrifying until he opens his mouth. Uh, <laughs> his mouth is always open, but, though. <laughs> well, until he starts making noise. Yes. But, um, uh, but I, I, I mean, visually, I thought it was creepy. I think the action aspect of it is fun. Again, it makes no sense. These these are ghosts that, like, even if you kill their form, they're just going to go to a different, like, I know I'm supposed to be defending this movie somewhere, but I don't know. I, I like it. it. To me, it's like, first off, it feels like he's trying to do a sci-fi version of uh, uh, Assault on Precinct 13. There's yes. definitely a Western element. That's what element. I was going to say, yeah. Yeah. It, there's definitely a Western element to it, a sort of, like, there's like the guns of Rhea Bravo. There's a definitely like a, a really fun homage. Like you, you could tell like when he was probably writing the script, you could already see what he was like watching, what he was interested in. You tell there's probably a fun movie in there somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I mean, when it, when it kicks into the action aspect of it, I enjoy it when it, the violence kicks in and it does all that like Carpenter sort of like slow-mo. There's a lot of aspects I like to it and I find enjoyable. And one thing I've said before is that I think it has a very high B-movie quality to it that I yeah. do enjoy. And I think um, the effects play into that. Absolutely. And I, and I think that is what to enjoy about, I think Carpenter would agree. He, he's gone out and actually said that he was intentionally making something big and dumb. Uh, but because yeah, which, put John Carpenter's name in front of it, which again, this should not necessarily mean a lack of big and dumb. Uh, yeah. but, but people's expectation levels went really high, and he actually compared it to stuff like Commando and uh, Rambo Two, uh, which is a, which. I mean, it's like a sci-fi a, version. Yeah, he just wanted to make a balls to the wall action flick that was kind of a elements of comedy. Uh, he he said yeah. since that he wishes that he had made the film a little bit more in on the joke itself, and he thinks that way yeah. people would have understood a little bit more what he was trying to do. And <laughs> this is again one of his quotes. It's called Ghosts of Mars, for Christ's sake. Why would people take this movie seriously? <laughs> <laughs> well said. The thing is that the movie is a sort of a spiritual sibling in uh, Starship Troopers because it's another movie that's sort of like a big, dumb, stupid, you know, kind of throwback movie as far as like the overall plot. Uh, there's actually another tie-in to John Carpenter, but I won't, I'll save it. But it's definitely like one thing that Paul Verhoeven did with Starship Troopers is he went, just he went high enough with the camp and the satire to make it where we could recognize it like smart audience would be like oh i see what this movie is carpenter didn't do that like it, it felt like it was just trying to be too cool and hip and slick when if he'd made it a little bit more like winking at the camera a little, a little bit i think it might have been more successful but also the cast is dog shit like sorry like the two main you know natasha Hentras and ice cube both were dog shit in that movie yeah. uh so you know but I still think the effects are fun. I think that the, the actual ghosts of Mars are actually fucking scary. I think the violence is pretty scary. Um, but yeah, it's a dumb movie with a giant, a ton of plot holes. So what do you think of it, Casey? Um, it's one I've, I only saw once. Um, again, I own it because I'm a completist when it comes to physical media. Yeah, but um, we are both. I don't think it's a good movie, but I don't think think it's completely unwatchable i do think much like james that casting is the biggest issue with it like just the dialogue like you know for being kind of like b-movie dialogue they just did not have the actors that could pull that off yep no successfully I, that's exactly i think you nailed it it was the actors all the way yeah and um but i like you said there, there are things that are somewhat entertaining about it but yeah it's definitely low low end of the totem pole as far as the carpenter movies i've seen but it's not it's not something i would be like 
oh god just avoid that movie at all costs it's like the worst shit ever you know i think the worst thing about it is that it's got john carpenter's name on it i think of it kind of yeah yeah if if paul ws anderson had directed it it might be the second best movie he ever did exactly (laughs) truly yeah and um very well put so yeah and the thing about carpenter overall in general is that i mean i can't speak for the ward because i haven't seen it but there's always something interesting about his films that you're going to be able to find like pleasure in no matter if it's just complete you know dog shit of a movie or like you know whether it's just extremely weird or just you know whatever the reason it's like he's that's what that's what i love about him is that it's never not interesting with him you know whether it's a completely you know home run of a movie or not like there's something about it that always deserves its attention and always deserves to be watched except for the ward but yes (laughs) yeah like i said i can't i can't comment on the ward because i haven't seen it so you should see the ward because like me you were a completist and the ward is rewarding enough to a completist most of the world probably shouldn't see the <laughs> the Carpenter fans should maybe see this. Yeah, I, I, exactly. Like I said, if you, I mean, if you've seen if if you've seen like the Village of the Damned and like then yes, I, you should. see I, Yeah, I think that honestly, with the la- the final kind of output that Carpenter had the last twenty years or so, the Ward is only debatable as the worst one. I agree with that. If you, yeah. It's not getting because it's not it, that's again it's not because it's not a terrible movie it's just like it's such a letdown I think it's so disappointing word, that more of the word works than Ghosts of Mars but I'm more likely to put on Ghosts of Mars because it's a little more over the top yeah I mean look that and that's where I will argue what the true value of the film is because is the word a more competently made and written and produced film yes is Ghosts of Mars infinitely more entertaining for me yes <laughs> you're just shooting ghost. It's like self mutilation, ghost masochists, and like, <laughs> give me that. Who screaming so, all vowels too? It was. Uh, <laughs> that, yeah, sometimes just the dumbest, most absurd movies can be the most entertaining. Yeah. Like you know, it's like you could recognize it as not being a good movie, but you know that in itself could be entertaining. <laughs> so well, yeah, it's, it, it's particularly with this. Uh, I didn't see it in its original run, and I did know a few things going in that I wouldn't have had the advantage of knowing going into the theater. the The main ghost, the big bad guy with the you know the guy that looks like he belongs in uh, Death Clock and Metalocalypse. <laughs> he had these big prosthetic teeth, and he was supposed to actually speak in the Martian language that was supposed to they had written another language for the martians yep. to speak to one another and it was supposed to be super creepy that they were speaking a language that there's no way in hell that the earthlings would be able to understand but then they gave him these big ass teeth to put in his mouth and the only sounds <laughs> he could make were oh, rah, 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 rah. so that's <laughs> that became the martian language was just this one dude shouting oh, rah, 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 to the whole thing and you know if i hadn't known that going in I think I would have thought it was one of the worst villains in history. Uh, <laughs> but no, it almost that, makes it endearing now. <laughs> exactly. Now I'm looking at it and I'm like, oh, there he goes again with those big fucking teeth. <laughs> like that poor dude. <laughs> right. He's doing the his thing best. Is, man, <laughs> the thing is, the character, I, like I said, I think he looks cool, but two things with it have, have kind of struck me. One is he looks like a full moon villain. <laughs> like he looks a little too close to like Radu or something right? uh, for me, for me to take it super seriously. The other thing is that he, sp- he bears a striking resemblance that I, I'm, I don't know if it's the same actor. I, I pretty sure it's not, but uh, well, I, I think at this point, I think we should talk about his, uh, uh, in the similar vein of at this, especially this period. Should we talk about uh, John Carpenter's vampires? That was sure. probably, that was the next one I was going to bring up. And then we've got the heavy hitters to close up. Perfect. So uh, that's a movie again. In fact, it, sometimes there'll be a movie that comes out where like, when I come out, I see it for the first time. I'm always like, oh man, I think my friends are going to hate this movie, but I liked it. But I, I think I'm going to keep it, keep play that close to my best. Uh, I remember coming out of uh, As Above, So Below going, that movie's really dumb, but I'm, I, I kind of, I kind of dug it. I, I'm gonna wait to see what people say. I'm gonna be lambasted, but um, but it was a movie I watched, and I was like, first off, like it is based off of a novel. Our mutual friend Tom was a big fan of the of the novel by John Stakely. Uh, in the book, it's vampires, and then the S is a cash money symbol. 
But I remember um, when he was reading that. Yeah, and he was really into it. And John Stakely wrote this book called Armor, which has influenced a ton of other movies as well. But anyways, it's one of those things where like, yeah, it's not a great movie. And I like, I have a weird love-hate relationship with James Woods because as a a human being, I don't want anything to do with him. But, uh, you know, as a actor he's fucking great i mean the thing is he's great uh going back to i mean he's he's a great actor at least he used to be it's one of those things where it's like the first time i saw it i was like wow that i kind of dug that like there's a lot of weird things about the movie uh casting the least likable uh which is saying a lot baldwin brother uh in it (laughs) but i walked to the thing i was like wow i I actually really liked the the vibe of that movie like it had that like kind of like it has almost like a weird like comic book feel to it like there's just a vibe to it like it's a one once again we all know john carpenter loves westerns yet never actually made one not a legitimate one it has a western vibe to it it does carry this capture the spirit of the the book like really well it's not a great movie and it it casts a lot like uh you know you know you have james wood and then some like you know, a lot of character actors or, and people who aren't, you know, weren't great actors. But I, I think everybody was really good in it. Even the like sort of Euro trash vampire in it, um, which was like what I was saying, like he looks strikingly a lot like the vampire from Vampires. I forget the character's name. But like, I thought like, like all the, like the, the, it's a really great balance of action movie and horror movie. You know, it's very much like in, in the Blade kind of tradition. But it's weird because like, I liked it when I first saw it, but I, I, I knew, recognized it's not a great movie, but I really enjoyed it. I love, I think the opening sequence is great. I think there's like, I don't know how many times you can beat and insult that poor like lady who was bit by the vampire, like <laughs> unnecessarily mean to her. But, uh, and, and again, James, James Woods like turns up the, the sort of sarcastic dickhead to a point where you're like, I don't know if you're even likable anymore. Yeah. But, he, he, but yeah, it's that was, fun. Uh, What's that? That was kind of my thing with it too. It's like James Woods character. It's like, it just it gets burnt out really quick for me like i like i think there's again i think there's stuff in the movie that's enjoyable but like the persona that james wood's character has just like it, like as other characters are going through like more stuff through the the course of the movie it's like he's still just like the same person yeah <laughs> there's no and art again, yes. yeah there's no art for him and it's just and it's just kind of like really one note and so it just kind of got old for me really quick but there, again, but there is stuff in that movie that is cool, and it, like I said, I don't think it's a total loss if you were to watch it. But again, it's not high up on the Carpenter filmography for me, definitely. It's been pretty divisive long- uh, amongst yeah. Carpenter fans. It, it's probably out of all of the films, the one that uh, people tend to draw lines at, because most people tend to agree with the ones that we've called out as not being the best. But vampires could go either way depending on who you're talking to. Everybody knows how associated with family guy James Woods was at one point. And of course they've had enough of them. They've gone so far as to rename the school James Wood high as Adam West high uh, in more recent episodes. Uh, but at a time James Woods was very, was, was kind of outside of Adam West, the most known real life celebrity that had a character on family guy and would pop up over and over again. And there's one where Brian, the dog is creating a sitcom or actually he's creating an hour long drama and James Woods comes in to read for the part and they take James Woods and he starts to step all over it and turn it into his own thing. I get the feeling that he probably did something very similar to John Carpenter. <laughs> uh, he I was, wouldn't doubt it. Woods was known for coming in and making things his own and pissing his directors off. Like, how dare you say this isn't James Woods' movie sort of attitude. But to me, it seems like the character that he plays, whose name is Crow, was written to be the typical John Carpenter badass and denim sort of character and that woods on every turn was like no 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 i think he should be a dick you know like on every (laughs) single turn it was almost kind of like a parody of that that type of person yeah woods never rises above feeling like he's making fun of the role by being there as opposed to a kurt russell or roddy piper or uh even jeff bridges or yeah so I, I, it's funny. I've said forever the only my thing with with because especially and again, James Wood almost like seems like he doesn't belong in the movie. First off, James Wood is like some badass like bounty hunter. Oh, I would have. No, fallen. I'm not buying. No, no, but I would have if I was making vampires and I heard that James Woods was interested in playing a vampire hunter, I would have taken the call. So I, I don't blame him. Yeah, no, that's the thing is though he and that's the thing is because he's a great actor. My thing is like how much better or more enjoyable, how much more fun it would have been if John Carpenter 
called on Roddy Piper, who at this point was making movies with Billy Blank, so I'm sure he was available. Put put somebody like Roddy in there, who would have been one happy to have the role, and two really could have like found the fun in the role instead of like making it this sort of sort of uh, caricature. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But either way, and I did not like the Euro Trash vampire. By the way, by then I was done with Euro Trash vampires. I felt like the '90s was full of vampires with long, uh, greasy, luxurious hair. And at that point, I just the moment I see one, I just want to stick a stake in. But, well, but any, I, any, anybody associated with Karate Kid Part Three is going to sour any film <laughs> that they're associated <laughs> with. So it's understandable. I think hey, you now. got a good point there. Uh, but James, I love. Love Cry Kid Part Three. Anyways, oh man, well, that's I want right to. I even like the next Karate Kid. I will have you know. Anyways, James, th- this this is a family show. I don't think we need to be. <laughs> 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 oh, the best part is I'm calling this a family show, and last week we had a whole segment that I would call Willem Dafoe's Cock and Balls. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, oh, but speaking of speaking of James, I want to know what you think about this movie. Had it been the original casting, do you know anything about the original casting? I think, I mean, I'm pretty sure, I think there's either, I even watched a documentary about it, but I, I, I can't recall currently, so. Willem Dafoe is the head vampire, which would have been worlds cooler than the guy they got. And yeah, I mean, in oddly, another one of those examples of the only time that these actors would ever be associated, but the James Woods role was originally going to be Dolph Lundgren. Dang! <laughs> and and Bruce Campbell was Carpenter's pick for uh, the Baldwin character. Dude, I was literally just about to say, and I made this point before, but like the fact that he never worked with Bruce Campbell makes no goddamn sense. He did me. on Escape um, to L.A. Oh, that's true. Yeah, but that's but he wanted. That's true, to I work, forgot. Yeah, but he did want to work with him on this one. But for, I will say this about uh, and again, yeah, Willem Dafoe. I mean, yes, I'll take Willem Dafoe as a vampire anytime. But I will say this. Even though he's a terrible, like, I mean, the guy wasn't a great act, necessarily a great actor. Although, I, I mean, he was very imposing in this movie. In fact, that scene, scene when they like they go to like that nest and they kill the vampires and they go to celebrate at that shitty like motel roadside motel. Yeah, one of the most that sequence parts of the movie. is fucking badass. Yeah, that was yeah. a sequence where I'm like, damn, this movie's pretty bad fucking ass. Even the and everything that happens in the next like ten minutes after that, when like the chase and everything. But um, but that was yeah. John Carpenter who made that cool. He shot that really well. It could have been any actor yes. doing the the motion. I did not like the actor. Yeah, but I, I mean, I think his stature and the look. I think you know, yeah. I I mean, I liked it. But I, I I mean, but again, I also like I have a soft spot for those sort of a uh, shitty vamp. I mean. You know, uh, the full moon vampires. I'll just yeah. refer to them as that. But no, they've got. But yeah, their I mean, place. I, I get it. They they definitely got their place. But we were uh, talking, and these are. I, I just I don't. But I totally feel vamp- you. Yes. If I'm not if I'm making a vampire movie, I'm not putting a casting call out to extras from the Highlander ever, and that's kind <laughs> of what I felt like '90s vampires were. <laughs> it's true. Who's the worst? And I was just having this conversation. But who's the worst '90s vampire in any film? And he's a good. And this guy's a good actor too. But God, I know you're not talking about Gary Oldman because Oldman's amazing. No, okay. uh, Blade Three with their fucking uh, uh, Blade Three, which talented people. Yeah. Oh, good lord! <laughs> but, Ryan Reynolds in a comic book movie, uh, Take One. But, yeah, exactly. Which I, I he's still the best thing about that fucking movie. Yeah. Um, but who was him in? Uh, I'm trying to remember now who the villain was. He so the actor's been a ton. He he was in that show Prison Break. He's on. Uh, he's always on like WB shows, but he plays Heat Wave on. And like he played him on The Flash and uh, Legends of Tomorrow. But he's a he's a decent actor. In fact, he's really likable on Legends of Tomorrow. But he plays the most greasy douchey version of Dracula that's ever been on screen. If you've never seen Blade 3, it's almost <laughs> worth it. But um, I haven't, actually. You've never seen Blade 3? No, I've only seen 1 and 2. Oh, dude, you know, oh, that movie is... Ugh, good Lord. It, the, no, I think, I think it's, what's sad is I think I own it because I think I bought the Blade trilogy as a one pack thing. It cements the fact that... They should have stopped at uh, 2. <laughs> they should have stopped at 1. I, I, I even... You didn't I don't like even like the, the Guillermo del Toro one. You don't like? No, no. It's got it has potential, but no, I don't like it. It's got so many cool moments, but the movie light doesn't bend around corners. Anyways, I'm not going to get into this uh, <laughs> the science of the Blade movies, but anyways, um, let's let's finish wrapping about vampires. But yeah, I I actually enjoy it, but it's not a great movie. But you know what it is? It is a 
fun weekend movie where you just put it on and you don't have to think of anything and just like watch it is that yeah so my last take on vampires is you know you were talking about the one cool sequence or whatever where they you know visit the nest or whatever and go back to the motel room and all that i think because after that happens there's no other sequence in the movie that's as cool as that and that's exactly and that's a problem. It's like it's a big problem. You, you set this bar and you're like, all right, this is going to be badass. And then the rest of your movie falls flat that doesn't hold up to that. Like, that's a drawback. I agree. Yeah. That's a fantastic you, point. You just nailed it. Before we get on to a couple of these big hitters, we've pretty much got nothing but big hitters left. I do want to give a quick shout out to Body Bags. It's, it's a movie, but not a movie. But if we're going to talk about Masters of Horror, uh, Body Bags is worthy of mentioning too, which is a show that he was going to do for... Showtime that got to the pilot phase and uh, the pilot played as an hour and a half long anthology movie. Uh, And because it was shot for Showtime, it was able to be as R rated and as lovely as it wanted to be. And John Carpenter directed the first two segments and the third segment uh, was actually directed by the late great Toby Hooper and starred Mark Hamill. Uh, And that one has its own perks too. But the two that Carpenter directed, one takes place in a gas station at night and is creepy as hell uh, and is actually packs as much impact as a full John Carpenter movie into roughly a half an hour worth of material. And the second one was a dark comedy, which was his first time working with Stacey Keach and is hysterical where Stacey Keach plays a guy who's balding and he goes to kind of one of those... uh, one of those classic EC comic sort of trappings. It's like the people that go to beat smoking addiction or whatever. Yep. He, he goes to a balding clinic and they, instead of putting in real hair, which is what the advertisement pronounces, they're little aliens that attach to his scalp and grow out yeah. like hair. And so he starts to get this full head of hair and then it starts to spread to this full beard and then it keeps on spreading. And he realizes his whole body is going to be eaten alive by his new hair. And it's actually, the whole thing's hysterical, but by the end, it's actually kind of creepy, which in a kind of a yep. lonesome death of Jordy Barrel kind of way. One hundred, you're, everything you're saying is stealing right out of my mouth. Exactly. And it <laughs> feels like an EC comic. I think that's obviously was probably an inspiration. I think it's fantastic. I actually really like that that movie. Anthology, uh, let's call it. it. Exactly. But it's the same thing like with like, uh, you know, um, Creepshow or whatever. It's, I'll, it's a movie, you know, it's, I mean... My biggest thing is that he was so great as that sort of crypt keeper role of the creepy morgue guy. I'm like, yes. I feel talk we- about Carpenter himself. Carpenter himself played yep. the crypt keeper, and he was literally, uh, and he was, he was the morgue guy in that. He was the, the morgue guy. Or- he doesn't, yeah. And dude, he was so fucking great in it. And I feel like we were cheated by not having that be like a weekly show because yes. he was really perfect in it and like he's already so weird looking and i like how the makeup just took what's already kind of weird looking about him and just accentuated it but yeah i I didn't that's something i didn't see until the shout factory released it and i was really happy with it and i I do like i actually have to take back uh something i said earlier i have not seen body bags so there's the fourth thing i haven't seen (laughs) but again i do own because of shout factory and i've been trying to collect all of the carpenter discs i've been picking those up too I definitely got to stick it on. I, it's something I've always meant to watch. I just never got around to it. It's fun, man. I mean, it's again, it's it's you're not going to think too much. Just put it on, and it's a fun like little anthology series. Yeah, yeah. and I've and I've especially been getting into anthologies lately. Like I've watched Baba's uh, Black Sabbath. I watched oh, so um, good. Tales from the Dark Side for the first time in years. Oh, that's a good. Uh, one. Yeah, if you guys get a chance, definitely watch Body Bags, Casey. If you haven't seen it, I think you'll get a kick out of it. Yeah, it's, I'm I'm going to soon. It's very 90s, but Carpenter, like we said, as the the coroner at the beginning of the movie, uh, kind of playing the Crypt Keeper role. And we, <laughs> they put him in kind of some uh, haggard-looking makeup, and I'm getting the feeling they didn't have to put much on Yeah, him. <laughs> you know, the reason, honestly, the reason why I forgot that I hadn't seen it is because I have seen that footage of him in that character, and I've seen the footage of, like, Mark Hamill and stuff. So it's like, every time it gets brought up, it gets brought up I feel like I have seen it. Mm-hmm. But then I'm like, oh, no, I actually haven't like sat down and watched this thing. Uh, but if if I was able to during the pandemic, I would go up to your house and watch it with you because I've actually had a hankering. It wasn't one I was able to revisit. I do have the disc. But uh, if we were to enjoy a particular substance beforehand, it is definitely <laughs> a, a movie that goes along well with that state of mind. Fair enough. Now, I'm going to mention... You're talking about uh, crack cocaine, right? Dude, or did I misinterpret tra- that? Most tranquilizers, actually. Oh, okay, good. Okay. I'm talking about both, man. I'm talking about one in each arm. 
Um, exactly. Any Anything we're doing is yeah. worth doing right. Exactly. <laughs> Anything we're doing is worth doing twice. Um, That's right. That too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there is a particular alien movie that Carpenter was a part of that I we have not mentioned yet. And I'm sure you guys... Which one? <laughs> I think you know exactly what I'm talking about when I say the title Dark Star. <laughs> I was going to say, I was waiting for that. Uh, we've gone over Dark Star before uh, in our special episode about 1974 uh, when the movie was originally yep. released. Dark Star is a lot of fun, especially if you know John Carpenter's films. Um, you can see some little glimpses of things to, to come. But within the realm of this conversation, I think we're probably well enough to say just go listen to the 1974 episode. You'll probably learn everything you need to know about Dark Star, his, his first film that he uh, made at USC. I am talking, in fact, about a little movie called The Thing, which also happens to be, if a gun was held to my head and I was asked to pick my number one favorite horror movie out of all my favorite horror movies, The Thing would probably be the It's something that goes back to my childhood, goes way back to my childhood, as a matter of fact. Uh, I remember watching this when I was like three or four years old uh, with my dad, and my dad was being very careful and putting his hands over my eyes for the bad scenes, and because otherwise it's just a bunch of guys running around in the snow. And I remember seeing through his fingers, uh, I don't know whether he purposefully left a space there for me to look through or not, but I definitely remember looking through my dad's protective giant hand over my face and seeing the, the scene where the doctor's arms go into <laughs> Norris's belly and get bitten off. Uh, and that's still a scene that just shocks me every time. It's got everything a good horror movie needs. You could argue maybe that it's science fiction, but this this sucker definitely belongs in the realm of horror to me. Uh, it's more yes, frightening than any other science fiction. Like, it's scarier than Alien, frankly. Uh, which I agree. Is probably what it's what it's compared to the most. There's so much like gore and crazy shit in the movie that it just it definitely transcends. It's not just a sci-fi movie. It's not just a horror movie. Exactly, and, and the gore. It's not just that the gore is plentiful, which sometimes in '80s horror movies is enough. You know, like oh, it had a lot of blood in it. That's cool. No, this had amazing special effects that still to this day stand up as amazing special effects, much like uh, American Werewolf in London. Yeah. There's just no topping yeah, the, what they were able to do in the early 80s with those prosthetics and puppeteering. And it, it still is the most frightening looking monster, the most frightening monster functionality. It, it's a mon- it's an alien that crash landed on Earth and uh, crash landed in the in, in Antarctic and basically has been sitting frozen in the ice waiting to be discovered so that it can melt our bodies into like one organism and there's no even way of of being able to tell if the people who have been assimilated by the thing even know or or whether they're even conscious that they've been assimilated into the thing the people certainly are dead they get it kills them and then becomes them but because it's running off of the memories of that person you never know if that person who is the thing is in this weird spiritual limbo of knowing it's the thing or not knowing it's the thing or what uh, there's so many what ifs to this movie. There's so many unanswered questions about the ending. Uh, it's just expertly shot. It's expertly acted. This is the first time that Kurt Russell was brilliant in a movie. As much as I love Snake Plissken, uh, Snake Plissken was an amazing character, but I don't think that, I think McReady is better played than his Snake yeah, Plissken. Uh, absolutely. And is, is a more realized, uh, realistic character. Uh, and also the first appearance of Keith David. Some of the most fantastic performances. Uh, it's very much about male camaraderie on a certain level. It's all about the paranoia of masculinity in a way uh, by having an all-male cast. Uh, the fact that these are all in their own kind of way different versions of alpha dogs. You've got the military alpha dog. You've got the more militant alpha dog. You've got the drunk, I don't give a fuck helicopter pilot alpha dog <laughs> the brilliant scientist alpha dog it's a bunch of alpha dog being terrorized by a dog that turns out to be an alien uh what are your guys' thoughts on this because I, I think i've run out time on this never seen it just kidding <laughs> <laughs> hey that's my line <laughs> <laughs> no i mean yeah what do you, it's i think it's become one of those ones that if you're a horror fan it's like a given that you 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 love the movie. Interesting, you know, it, just like a lot of great films, wasn't well received when it first came out. One thing I think that's that you, I mean, you obviously you've said everything. It's a brilliant movie. The effects team with uh, was that Can Beats? 
No, it's uh, uh, Rob, Rob Bottin. Bottin. That's right, Rob Bottin. Uh, the B in uh, or the B in K and B, right? No, that that's Burger. Uh, Rob Bottin no, that's right. was his own thing. Yeah, Rob that's right. Bottin he was, his was own. Uh, Rob Bottin apprenticed under. Um, was it Baker? Yeah, Rick Baker. But it was, was Bottin did the Howling too, right? Yeah, because Baker yeah. was hired to do the Howling, and then Baker left Bottin behind to finish the Howling when he moved on to American Werewolf, which he had Werewolf him. previously promised to make before he got signed on to the Howling. Uh, but Bottin came directly from the Howling, I believe, onto this and actually had to be hospitalized during the filming of the movie because he was facing exhaustion with all the work that he was being put under between the Howling and the Thing. Probably two of the most important effects jobs. Yeah, pretty um, pretty labor day. intensive for yeah. <laughs> visual and a, effects makeup artist. And he was a young kid too. He was like twenty one or something at the time that, that he was doing this. So he was pushing. He was even trying to get John Carpenter to let him play one of the guys in the movie. I guess he had played one of the uh, werewolves in uh, the Howling or something. But uh, but yeah, I mean no, the no, effects. No, are... I know what it was. He he had done the fog and he played. He was the captain ghost in the fog. The one that oh, goes around with the big sword. And so he was trying yeah. to talk Carpenter into giving him another role. And Carpenter's like, I don't know, man. We're going to have to put you in the hospital. I can't give you another role. And they, he literally ended up getting hospitalized trying to make this incredible fucking alien stuff. But yeah, I mean, the, the effects hold up to the point that even, you know, 20 years later, uh, they tried to do the, the prequel and with brand new technology. And it doesn't even compare. No. no. Um, yeah, that was almost a uh, sequel as a sci-fi series which carpenter had been on board with he wasn't going to direct it but he was going to produce it uh and the the prequel reboot i don't hate it as much as other people do i completely i don't either the effects were really a travesty because they had actually shot it with live effects and some dickhead at the studio uh decided no let's let's paint over it with uh, with digital i swear to god someday my tombstone is going to say the studio (laughs) fucked with the end but (laughs) So I, I blame that on the studio more than the artist as far as what I dislike the most about the, the Thing prequel. But it was a great idea if you were going to do something to go along with the Thing. A prequel of what happened in the Norwegian base is is a good concept. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah exactly. Oh, I, I did think that it was interesting that you know it was a prequel that was a sequel and yet bit directly so much from Carpenter's Thing. Yeah. That, yeah. you know, it was almost basically like a remake. So there was like a lot of interesting things about that that i that i kind of enjoyed but yeah the cgi kind of trashed anything that could have been good about that film yeah it was again it was so close to being something that i would have wanted to see again and i just haven't i did go to see it in the theater where i think it was one of five people that saw it theatrically and that killed any kind of chance that we were ever going to see anything else about the thing but there was at one point going to be a sci-fi series and it was going to be fully gory sci-fi channel has said this is before they were sci-fi with two y's yeah and it was going to be a two-part thing over two nights which we here at den of sin know nothing about but uh, (laughs) (laughs) sarcasm yeah but uh (laughs) anyways i guess one of the main points though about this uh sequel for uh sci-fi channel is that it was going to prequelize in a completely different way that i actually find even more interesting than what they ultimately did with the prequel which was how did the thing get its spaceship that it landed on earth with because there is the question of the ship that it landed in is that really what the thing drives or did he take over another culture and that's the reason why they crash landed on earth is because the other culture was trying to get rid of the thing and drop it somewhere else so So basically it would have been it would have been like the prometheus of the thing Yes, exactly. It would have been what led to what led to what led to the Norwegians finding. It. But uh, it, it, their that would idea, have been interesting. I would have watched that. Their idea was that you know, hey, we see the thing turn into so many different creatures that certainly whatever actually owned this UFO before the thing got on board would be something that we've already seen the thing do. Like maybe it would have answered the question as to uh, you know the the spider leg creatures or the the tentacle creatures or whatever choice they would have ultimately have ended up with. And then there was a whole other element of it that uh, involved the little tiny piece of the thing making it back to mainland. And that's why it was a two-parter was uh, they were going to cover a little bit of this backstory and then tell the story of what would happen if the thing actually reached the rest of us instead of staying isolated in, in Antarctica. And it, from what I've heard, I have not read the script, but I... <laughs> Like so many other people, I heard a podcast. <laughs> I heard a podcast featuring people that wrote the script, and it, 
it's called uh, the best movies never made. And they did a, uh, a big one on this particular version of the thing. And there was a scene involving a guy who's like making breakfast on the mainland that matched the blood sample scene from the original. It was the companion piece to that scene, but you didn't see mm-hmm. it coming because he's just cracking eggs and the thing was one of the eggs. So as soon as it hits the fryer, it's going to jump up in his face. And I think that would have been, even for a oh, fan, awesome. as a fan of the original, it not only would have locked into me loving it because of the reference to the original, but it, I'm sure it would have knocked me on my ass. I'm sure I would have jumped at that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Dude, wow, that's, that's amazing. So, and it also proves the thing could be anything it wants to be. Like, the thing can be our food. How do you avoid something that can be our food? So right. it, it posited a lot of those questions in this remake. So too bad we never got to see this. Carpenter apparently was fully on board. I think it did actually answer the question as to whether uh, McReady and, and Childs survived the first one. I can't remember what the answer actually was. And it doesn't matter at this point because we don't have it. Yeah, exactly. But it, it would have given us an answer to a few of the things uh, going on. In the, what, what were do you, When did you see this movie, Casey? I, again, was... This wasn't a movie I grew up uh, with. It's something I probably saw the first time maybe sometime 10, 15 years ago. But from the first viewing, I was just like, oh my God, like how have I not seen this movie before? You know, and um, it's, I, it's definitely, I think, his best movie. The story works. Everybody, all the actors are great. And again, like the effects and the makeup are just like just some next level shit that like I've not seen. I don't think still. Yeah. In a, in a movie like no matter how many good you know makeup effects movies there are it's just like there's just something about the thing that you just cannot be touched it's you know the fact that the creature's not like some set looking thing it could morph into anything and they sure as shit ran with that like mm-hmm. you know on an epic level like because just it you know there's no holding back in the thing it's just like what's the craziest thing we could do and let's let's go and yeah. and it's right th- and it's right there on the screen and it's just absolutely amazing and it's, it's like, just one of the this one of the most super fun horror movies you could ever watch and it's funny too the whole bit about like i'd like to not spend the rest of my life tied to this fucking chair yeah, yeah. or uh the the classic line that you've got to be fucking kidding, fucking kidding. <laughs> <laughs> talk about a character summing it up for the rest of the audience uh it's just... which i found which i found out today i was watching um the eli roth history of horror and they were talking about uh with bill Hader about it chapter two and yeah that's it yeah and there's a thing where you know it has the thing more to the spider which is straight up bite from the thing and he's like yeah we we literally like watched the thing on my phone so i could deliver that line like verbatim <laughs> in it too where it's like you've got to be fucking kidding, be kidding me <laughs> yeah. So, yeah i mean it's just it's it's just a fantastic movie that uh that is the best poor part of it part two by the way just that <laughs> that sequence um the thing is like one thing is like you know i hear the thing from another planet is actually a really good movie um, it is it is I'm yeah, glad i didn't even it. I didn't even really realize that until a few years ago uh, or even relatively, even maybe soon, like more recently. But, but the thing is, it's like there's one of the most effective emotions that you can do for an audience to really keep them engaged is to create a sense of paranoia and distrust within the movie itself so that you don't, even if your allegiance, you start to feel one way for a character, if the director can create, paranoia distrust within you for a character you've already grown to love like that really fucks with an audience but it's really hard to do you have to i mean there's a craft there there's an art to doing that effectively and the thing one of my other class on how to do that oh absolutely absolutely in fact i mean that's i think it's one of the biggest things of the film is you know that fear of being in that spot of like you don't know who to trust my other favorite sci-fi horror movie is the 1970s version of invasion of the body snatchers yeah and i think there's something to be said for carpenter because especially having done halloween he knows how to set tension how to set you know, make make a, uh, an audience ready for the next jump scare or ready for the next scare. But adding that element of like, you know, like in Michael Myers, we don't know who Michael Myers is as a person, but we know he's the bad guy. So taking that and amping it up by going like, we, you don't know who's Michael Myers. You don't know who the who, who the boogeyman is. I mean, that's fucking genius. And it, but it also is masterfully done. And again, to your point, the actors in it are really what 
I mean, the actors in their portrayal, it is probably, which I can see why, in hindsight, I can see why it wasn't, you know, I can see people not liking that and not getting with that. And the, a lot of the, the characters are cold. They're not like, you know, even Kurt Russell's character, he's not like, he's not this warm, friendly, you know, film hero. It, it, yeah, they're all the played he, in a much... You, feel, you almost feel like he's in Antarctica because he just wants to be his PTSD self and drink himself to death. And this is where right. he's going to go get a job to do it. That's all right. That's just, well said. So, and it shows, you know, yeah, it's kind it's, of a, an interesting character point that I didn't, I hadn't really thought about until recently. He pours his whiskey into the computer when he loses the chess game to the computer. <laughs> uh, he calls it, he calls the computer a cheating bitch. Um, <laughs> that shows us right there that our main character likes a uh, stacked game and is willing to cheat to win uh, and is willing to uh, to fight back in a way that's irrational and potentially physically violent. So to make that our our superhero in the movie, to make him the one that we tack all of our hopes and fears to, I thought that was ra- a rather interesting choice. I always thought it was just a, a scene intended to be funny of, of McReady being drunk and playing chess with the computer and losing and being a bad loser. But I think that's deliberately to set the audience <laughs> off knowing this is a guy who might blow the whole place up just with everybody in it just to uh, win the game. That's incredible. I've never heard that take. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm smart I'm sometimes. trying to think of more to say about <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think more to say about the thing that like really hasn't been said so you know before because it's so like you know beloved and you know within the genre fans in general but it's if you have for whatever reason if you have not seen the thing it's definitely one of the it's one of the best remakes of all time it's there's just so much good about it that it's just not a movie that should be missed it's fantastic yeah Uh, of all horror movies there's maybe five or so horror movies that everybody should see regardless of whether they're horror movies. Yeah, it's definitely one of them. And this is one of them. Yeah. Like uh, citizen Kane level of horror movies. The thing is a masterpiece. Every second of it. It's every so performance. Heart- it's so heartbreaking to me that like it didn't do well and that it had the misfortune of coming out the same time <laughs> as ET did. It's exactly and, what killed I mean, it. Yes. People, yeah, did, people I, wanted warm, fuzzy, lovable aliens. That right. You know, they, with. They wanted like, ouch, and then, you know, Carpenter's like, fuck that. Exactly. (laughs) Total opposite way in the most epic way possible. And it's just like. You want to see a dog stomach bite your hands off? Yeah, man. And and at the same studio, by the way. It's kind of. (laughs) Yeah. How come nobody in Universal thought that it might have been a mistake to release these two movies in the same year? Yeah, cocaine. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have a feeling nobody that was communicating with the John Carpenter wing of Universal was communicating with the Spielberg. The wing Spielberg camp. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think they also expected to. To be fair, I think they expected ET to be successful, but I don't think they understood exactly how successful ET. Yeah, would be. nobody saw ET. Like, do you know how many studios passed on ET before it got to Universal? So that's it's the little alien that could. It's never against yep. ET to say that it killed the thing, but motherfucker, it killed the thing. Uh, yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> and Carpenter never really, I don't think, got over it. It is his favorite movie of of all of his movies. But he talks about how it took him years to get over that being a failure because he knew what he had. He knew it was a good movie and he knew how much work he had put into it and how much the other people around him were putting into it. And yeah, I mean, the craftsmanship on display in this movie is just so fucking like vast and intense. It's just like it's it just fires on all cylinders. And the fact that it was like a dud is just oh, man, it soul shattering man everything he made for years was somehow like a ptsd response to the thing like i gotta do a stephen king movie because stephen king's really popular and i need to do something that's really popular so there we get christine the idea of um starman was well I i can't leave my alien movies off this way i have to do a nice alien or else nobody's gonna like me so he does starman even on up, I mean, uh, they live in Prince of Darkness. He finally got control back. But even something like Memoirs of an Invisible Man, I think was him trying to say, look, look, I can do a studio movie. And to have that fail was probably just adding on to the injury of the thing 10 years prior. Because the thing in 92 was still something that everybody rented at the video store, but nobody really talked about. Yeah, so. no wonder all he wants to do is play video games. <laughs> Hollywood did him dirty. <laughs> right. Yeah, actually... <laughs> Here, let me, because we're getting so close to the end, I was going to save this for the end. 
but I think you just set it up to be the perfect time. I have this great quote from John Carpenter, in which he said, in France, I'm an auteur. In Germany, a filmmaker. In Britain, a genre director. And in the USA, a bum. Yeah, that's so disheartening, man, because, I mean, he's he's one of my favorite directors, and it's just, like, the fact that the U.S. is just not giving him the reception he deserves, like, on a nationwide level, like, is just... I mean, I will say, though, I will say at this point, that's kind of a hard argument. That's a hard point to argue. It's true. I mean, he definitely has his fans, and he's, you know, he's beloved within... Sure. Yeah, certain communities, for sure. In the last 10 years, people are starting to become a little more forgiving of stuff like Ghosts of Mars and to look past a few of some of the ones that fell short. But, I think it's because, like, I consider him to be, like, the Spielberg of horror, if that's yes. such a thing. Yes, and I And I don't understand why people, more people don't. Cause, because Spielberg, not every Spielberg movie is good, but, you know, you can't deny the ones that are great are great. Yeah. Exactly. Well, you know, he belongs and that's, as a part and that's of that how I feel discussion. about Carpenter. Yeah, he yeah. belongs in the conversation of the great artists who came from the 70s and really thrived in the 80s. He has earned a spot as much as Lucas, as much as Spielberg, as much as... Yeah. Way more than Lucas. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, speaking in terms of... Um, Lucas success, is the greatest t- toy seller of all time. That's yes. what George Lucas is. Although I, I think I would have taken a toy thing when I was a kid if I had, had the opportunity. Hell yeah, brother. Which I, I did. Uh, <laughs> in my 20s, I finally did get one of those uh, Todd McFarlane movie mo- maniac things. I still have mine, but it is broken because those McFarlane figures are really brittle and poorly made. Yeah, but it was also the only way in the early aughts that you were going to get a leather face. It's, that's right, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. And it's still the only way you're ever going <laughs> to yes. get a thing figure, apparently, so... Suncoast. Yes, I was fortunate to be working at a Suncoast when those came out, so I got all those. Like, yeah. it, and I got to thank you. Casey. You got me my first uh, retail job when you were assistant manager oh, at right. Suncoast. I came and worked at Suncoast, and that was I, I had already been a movie collector, but that's when I and I know you could probably say the same. That's when we went overdrive. When we oh yeah, that discount broke us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this brings us up to the. Uh, the reason for the season here. We are finally at the last John Carpenter horror movie we have not discussed here. Uh, anybody got any ideas? Uh, Halloween. <laughs> Give that man a cigar. Uh, Halloween, yes, John Carpenter, the beginning of John Carpenter, really. The, yeah. the movie that made him a name, uh, which is also incredible because he managed to get his name above the credit before he was even a above the credit yeah. level success. And I've always got to hand that to him. His name is above the credit on almost everything except for Memoirs of the Invisible Man. If there's uh, one thing I've learned working in film and television is that if you're willing to do something for like no money, they'll give you whatever fucking credit you want. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Halloween is really, I mean, we can talk about all of it as an uh, artistic achievement, but really it was a, a movie that shouldn't have made the impact that it did uh, and made cheap and quick and, made a shit ton of money so as we all know in hollywood that's really that's yeah, all they really give a shit about yeah so but yeah i mean what do you say about halloween that a thousand podcasts this week aren't probably already saying yeah it's true it's true and we've already I, talked about halloween in our jamie lee curtis episode and i believe that we ended up talking about halloween and other things that were completely not yeah. halloween related the one thing i will say about halloween is i didn't realize until within the past few years like how much it took from Bob Clark's Black Christmas. Yeah. I had never seen Black Christmas until a few years ago. And when I finally did, I was just like, holy shit. You know, like Bob Clark was kind of the first one to do that killer POV thing. And, you know, there, I could, you could definitely see that like the Black Christmas inspiration Carpenter was pretty much wearing on his sleeve during Halloween, even though it's its own kind of groundbreaking film in its own right. No, you're entirely right. I've actually read up on this. I, I've learned it. I, I learned this recently, but I see what you mean about Black Christmas. I've seen that for a while, the similarities, but I didn't know that the similarities were actually deliberate. And Carpenter actually approached Bob Clark and wanted to do a sequel to Black Christmas prior to doing Halloween. And much of that oh, wow. probably is what went into making uh, this script. There's conflicting stories. Uh, Bob Clark, uh, somewhere along the line, said that if he was going to do a Black Christmas sequel, it would have taken place on Halloween. Uh, but then the original script that John Carpenter wrote was The Babysitter Killers, and they later changed the name Halloween because they didn't have the finances to shoot the movie to take place more than one day. 
So it was, it was literally a time crunching thing. Like, okay, we can only set this movie over the course of one day. What day is that going to be? Well, duh, Halloween. Uh, So I don't know. It almost becomes a chicken or the egg type of question, but we do know that John Carpenter was at least friendly with Bob Clark, the writer director of black Christmas. And that it may or may not have begun. It's, seedling of a life as a actual sequel interesting i mean i, would, I mean obviously they, they both have some oh some sort of debt to peeping tom and yes but, certainly but the one thing that halloween definitely really started was the uh, concept of the killer being not just a psychopath but almost like a force of nature or something that you know ambiguously the, unstoppable Exactly. And the thing that that, that's, and again, you know, I kind of touched on this a little bit, even with Big Trouble in Little China, but the greatest thing that he did was not trying to overly explain anything. Yeah, I love the fact that there's no reason why Michael Myers does the things that he does. Like, it's, there's no rhyme or reason to it. And that makes it 10 times creepier than anything else going exactly. on exactly you know? even killing his but, sister in the beginning we're not given a motive motive he just no. he's, yeah he just he's a that's what he's put on earth to do is just kill and that's the thing like there's so much what he did with halloween that obviously <laughs> impacted everything that came out i don't know if i i think of his like it's a great movie obviously that's why we're here talking about it like jamie lee curtis is like you know, she acted before this, but this was her first like starring film role. She was only nineteen. At nineteen. The time. You know, we like audience is connected with her because you know she's Jamie Lee Curtis. But, but yeah, the movie's great. I'm almost mad at the legacy it created for its own mythology because uh, outside of ugh, it's hard, it's hard because I I do like Halloween two is fine. It's like kind of a I don't such, mind Halloween two. Yeah, it's I, I enjoy it. Halloween two is. Halloween 2 is like a B minus remake of Halloween 1. Yeah. Um, uh, There's some cool things about it, but you know, it's okay. Halloween 3 is great. And I, in fact, that's what I'm more bitter about is that they wouldn't like John Carpenter just do that idea, which is every year just making a new Halloween movie, but with a new story. Yes. It was an Um, anthology series and it's inception. One of my most unpopular opinions of cinema is that Halloween 3 is my favorite Halloween movie. Yeah. Yeah. That is um, quickly becoming like a thing. Like, it's just so weird and like just awesome. I I love it. But um, yeah, the reason why that failed is because they had already made two films with Michael Myers. And so it's like, if Halloween 3 was actually Halloween 2, like, I think not only would it have been successful, but, you know, there would be no Michael Myers sequels. Yeah, like it would just, yeah agreed. You know, it would be like a series of like Creep Show or an, other, any other kind of anthology series. And I find that interesting, like what, what that would have been. And I, I daydream about all the time. I daydream, yeah. especially by the, by, by the time part four would have come out, the other people like that were directing at the time that could have been involved, the different kinds of, I mean, I think about, I think about it to an unhealthy degree. You could have had a Halloween directed by Toby Hooper, a Halloween directed by Wes Craven. Uh, Romero. uh, like Right. Prince of Darkness could have been a Halloween movie. Yeah, absolutely. Look, Halloween four, like the return of Michael Myers is okay. It's got some cool parts, but it drags like nobody's fucking business. Yeah. Uh, Part five is meh. And then they just get subsequently worse after that. Um, uh, Casey and I went to see the new one together, and... but, but I, I'm not including the, the new ones because yeah. technically that is in this in its canon Halloween two. But uh, I actually really enjoyed that remake or the whatever you want to call the the, the 2018 one. Um, but the other ones, by the time you get to fucking, I know some people defend H two O because of its camp factor. Uh, they're all it's H two O shouldn't have had camp factor. That's the thing. If you're yeah. returning to roots, it shouldn't have had a camp factor. H two O was awful in my opinion. Yes. They're all bad. I mean, literally past three, the best you're going to get is, eh, it was all right. Like, which is just sad, but either and, way. And, and past three, that's when John Carpenter himself disconnected. Checked and said, out. You, guys, you guys do whatever you want. Send me a paycheck. Yep. Which I, will, I, I totally understand. And I will say this also about Halloween 3. I think that's one of my favorite. It, it might possibly be my favorite Carpenter uh, sound uh, score. It's great. Yeah. I mean, it's probably technically not his best, but yeah. I. It's no, just, but I, I love it. I I do like the story of the Silver Shamrock theme because they just basically were like, "What's something that's super catchy?" Uh, well, how about was it the Happy Birthday song that's basically a ripoff of? I forget the actual. No, it's uh oh, what is it? Mary had a little lamb. Mary had a little lamb. Yeah, Mary had a little lamb. Mary had yeah, whatever. But it's like, what? We're grown ups. 
I know, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but it's literally like, even if I say the word Silver Shamrock, all of a sudden, the next seven hours in my head is just, three more days till Halloween. <laughs> but I will say this is my quote of uh, the, I was going to say quote of the night, but I always say that. It is, a, it is amazing, you know, for obvious reasons. It, everything he did with that movie was really interesting. Which, by the way, um, we should point out it was a script by John Carpenter. It wasn't directed by it. Just to, What's up? For part three? Or are you back? No, I was saying, no, no, I was saying the first one. Oh, okay, I'm um, sorry. No, no, no worries. But, you know, it's legendary for every, for every reason. Like, you know, but I think it's more interesting because of what, like, if it, that movie had been a failure, think of all the movies we didn't get. Yeah. Because at that point, he probably would have just been another, you know, gone back to maybe done some TV and then disappeared. He probably uh, would have gone off and done some TV westerns. Yeah, he probably, probably would have been a much happier person. It probably, <laughs> but it was for the better of society that we got to see exactly. they live. And... Exactly. So, but yeah, I mean, it's, it. look, Halloween, the first original Halloween movie is fucking fantastic. He created a horror icon that is still, you will never not see that character. Even if they don't make another, even if they, the new three come out, the Halloween kills and then Halloween in. Halloween end. Like we may never see another Halloween movie for fifty years, but guess what you're gonna see? Michael fucking Myers. He yeah. created and he, again everything was hap dash on that film. You know, this is the story of them making it and like was it Pasadena that they filmed it? Yeah, actually. Yeah. yeah, like in the summer and they had to like make it look like fall and they just went to send the fucking dude out to buy a mask and he came back with a William Shatner Devil's Rain mask and they flipped it. Like there's just so much about it that just it shouldn't have even worked. Or again, it was originally gonna be called the babysitter murder. It was like a another like cheap draw drive-in movie um but he made history it's an amazing movie it still holds up to this day um i love that my favorite thing on earth is him talking shit on rob zombie and you know look i'm not going to try and turn this into a rob zombie uh episode but <laughs> rob zombie is an interesting person i think he, yeah. rob zombie is pure ego and i feel like if he had just been smart enough to work with an actual writer somebody that could i don't know write human dialogue without everybody sounding like a fucking psychopath from the fucking trailer park. Rob Zombie could have made some really great films. His, you know, I understand, like, if you're going to make a remake, do something different. But that's why you shouldn't re remake fucking Halloween. Because he basically chose to shit on everything that made the original Halloween work. Now, mind you, I actually love Rob Zombie's Halloween 2, because it's fucking batshit crazy. And it does seem like a giant F you to uh, Halloween fans and just cinema in general, which I have a little bit of appreciation for. But... But just the how much how much it artistically fails to be remade by Rob Zombie is shows you this the, the, the strength of it because whether it was intentional or not, almost like the way that Jaws was kind of not intentional. All the best aspects of Jaws were sort of a, by a fluke or by the limitations yeah. that they were working with. But God damn, did it, it still holds up? It's still a great movie. It's fucking Halloween. It's one of the Iconic biggest, score. most important. Yep. Oh, the fucking score, the song. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's amazing. And apparently uh, Robert England was hired at one point to uh, throw leaves around Pasadena to try to make it look like a <laughs> Midwest autumn. Uh, and I like that. Is that real? I, you know, yeah, I heard that too. Actually. I heard that too, but I, I, I didn't a, know if that was substantiated. It, it's a wiki fact, so take it for what it is. But there I like, go. I like the idea of Freddy Krueger lurking around the uh, original Halloween set. Den of Sin brought to you by Wikifacts. Yes. Although uh, something that is not a wiki fact, something that has been confirmed, and I will post the pictures to prove it, uh, John Carpenter actually did have James Cameron as a matte painter in Escape from New York. So yeah. these things do happen. But I, I would like to think that Robert England was spreading around this. I also he, was, that, he was trying to get work. And pumpkins were very hard to come by in Southern California yeah. in the middle of the summer. Uh, so There's so many elements of this movie that shouldn't have worked, but it's that level of care. You know how many people would have made the movie and said, fuck it, nobody's going to care about whether there's fall leaves on the ground. You know, give me yeah. one pumpkin. All you need is one pumpkin to make halloween work that's what every other director who sucks would do john carpenter comes yeah. in and says i don't care how little this movie is we're gonna make this thing look like it's fall and yeah. it's that level of caring on stuff that we're just looking past as we're watching the movie uh that that's what separates the uh craftsman from the artist in a lot of ways yeah but also the reason that you're looking past it is because it's presented in a way that's believable <laughs> it's like yes. yeah, that looks yes. like fall yeah, and Whereas the story is compelling. Pumpkin, and where if there's only one pumpkin, you'd be like, "Why the fuck is there only one pumpkin in this Halloween <laughs> movie?" Yeah, I will say this though too: how important, how iconic he is. Even the opening sequence 
jack the cut of the jack o' lantern has yeah. become iconic. If you see that jack o' lantern face, you're like, oh, it's the Halloween jack o' lantern. That yep. alone is insane. That's when you know a movie is iconic. So kudos Absolutely. to John Carpenter and that cast and the, that small crew. And uh, you know, I think obviously John Carpenter. This is the season where I think he's the most celebrated. But obviously, you know, we I know we all watch John Carpenter movies all year long. All year round. All year round. But I will say, like I said, the Halloween season would would not be what it is without that Halloween score and Michael. So it's my final thought on Halloween. <laughs> well, there's very little left to say, but I was very excited to name just a handful of movies that John Carpenter has been linked to. Some of them were never realized and some of them uh, were eventually made by other people. But just as a fun what if right here at the tail of the show, I'm going to list off some of the movies that John Carpenter almost made. And some of them, I mean, like almost to where he was about to walk onto the set and something went wrong. First off, I mentioned that he was going to do another Stephen King movie before Christine, and that was Firestarter. Uh, He also worked on the Philadelphia Experiment, The Ninja, Santa Claus the Movie, in which... Uh, rather than <laughs> rather than David Huddleston, his Santa Claus was going to be Brian Dennehy, uh, which would have been probably incredible. <laughs> uh, he was asked to come on board Top Gun. He was asked to do The Golden Child and did Big Trouble in Little China instead and couldn't believe that somebody else would want to make a movie about uh, ancient Chinese culture at the same time he was because there hadn't been one in a really long time. So it is kind of a A weird thing that those two movies were released relatively close. Uh, Armed and Dangerous with John Candy was almost (laughs) a John Carpenter vehicle. Uh, They almost got him back for Halloween 4, uh, The Return of Michael Myers. They also almost got him back for H2O. Uh, Fatal Attraction he almost made, but ultimately he backed out of it because he said, uh, this was already done better as Play Misty for me. He almost did Exorcist 3. He was about to make that. Uh, And then William Peter Blatty, the writer of the original material, took over. There was, of course, Escape from Mars, which became Ghosts of Mars. But Escape from Mars would have been the continuation of the Snake Plissken saga. Uh, There was also a sequel to Vampires, which they did do as a direct-to-video, but it was originally going to be a uh, theatrical release by Carpenter. Uh, He was going to do a TV pilot for Zombieland, uh, which was before Zombieland was turned into a movie. And now it'll probably be turned into a show, kind of coming back to its original source, I'm sure. But it was originally pitched to John Carpenter. Uh, There were rumors that he was working at one point on a Dead Space film and on a Sonic the Hedgehog film. Apparently he's a unapologetic uh, Sonic the Hedgehog nut. (laughs) And then there were a couple of them here that I saved to the end because I thought James would be particularly interested in these. Uh, First, I real quick, I will say though, I'm not a video game guy, but fuck his. First off, Dead Space owes some legacy to him, anyways. But he could probably make a bitch in fucking Dead Space movie. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay, and then uh, this one would have been really cool because he finally would have realized a all time lifelong dream if he had gotten this one. But he was tapped at one point to direct Tombstone with his buddy Kurt Russell, which I'm sure oh, would have been incredible. Uh, yeah. and then, I mean, Tombstone's not one that, of my, the, I was going to say, not that Tombstone already is Yeah, Tombstone's like one of my favorite Westerns of all time anyway. But yeah, yeah I definitely would have loved to see the John Carpenter's version for sure. Right. And, and it, I just, I want good things for John Carpenter. So I want him to make a Western someday. And then these are for James. Uh, Carpenter is a huge Godzilla fan and for years lobbied to bring Godzilla to the United States uh, and got very close a couple of times to bring Godzilla to the United States uh, b- before Roland Emmerich finally squashed that. And on the level of what is going to make James mad, this is what <laughs> the failure of Village of the Damned made it impossible for him to continue with Universal on a projected remake of The Creature from the Black Lagoon. Oh, I've heard that before, and yes, that pisses me off, dude. <laughs> yeah, I would have loved to have seen that. <laughs> that would have been dude, incredible. He, he, and honestly, I think I can't think of another person that could like make that work, especially at that time. At that time, like, no. I mean, Guillermo del Toro on uh, Shape of Water did about as good of a job as anybody's going to do in terms of creating a story about a gill man. And that movie's beautiful and couldn't have been made yep. any, by anybody else on that level. But Carpenter in the mid 90s, mid to late 90s, doing a Creature from the Black Lagoon movie, uh, underwater photography had really finally kind of gotten to the point where it was possible. And uh, with if he had had, say, Rob Bottin and kind of had the gang back together from the thing, I'm sure 
they would have created a, an incredible creature and, and would not have, uh, maybe it was a mistake to say the thing because the thing is such a disgusting, vile thing. I, I'm sure that Carpenter would have brought the appropriate humanity to the Gill Man. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was going to say. Exactly. Yes. Very much what, like what you said, what, you know, Guillermo del Toro did with Shape of Wire, like I said, bringing that humanity. I think the other thing, though, he would have brought is I think he could have made it genuinely also really scary, too, yeah. and make it pretty intense. So sad, <laughs> sad, but, you know. Speaking of, um, you know, projects that almost were, uh, I've got two books on order. Uh, they're called uh, Taking Shape. Uh, uh, one, yeah, uh, first one's about, you know, Halloween and all the sequels, but the second part just came out, and it's all about the Halloween scripts that never that were like written but never were filmed, Ooh. and I guess there's like I don't know like fifteen to twenty I, or something. I, I believe yeah, then there's like if, if you read Fangoria in the nineties, like I did uh, <laughs> yeah. religiously, every couple of weeks there was another Halloween. Like Tarantino was doing a Halloween at one point. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm kind of interested to read that book because because the Tarantino ones, and in fact, I think the guy that they actually interviewed the guy that wrote the one Tarantino was going to be attached to. And it's like the first time he's really ever talked about it. So I'm kind of interested to see what that book has to say. Yeah. you'll have to I, Either the guys who wrote the book that were just on a po- just came out on a podcast or a YouTube show, but I actually maybe two hours before we started recording this, I saw that somewhere on my social media that they were talking about that. And I was like, Oh shit, I need to, I need to check that out. Cause it was super interesting. Oh well, guys, I think we've said about all we're going to be allowed to say about John Carpenter. I know that. <laughs> We'll talk about him plenty as as time goes on. And whenever we hit a a year that has a John Carpenter movie, or you know, a, a, whenever we get around to our inevitable Kurt Russell episode, uh, we'll we'll bring him up up again. His name will continue to come up a lot, but it's it's deserving. I I think he's influenced all three of us. All three of us are artists, and I, I think it's also just such a, an incredible part of our upbringing, our creative upbringing. And this is the three of us have been talking about John Carpenter off and on for over 20 years and the conversation still has never gotten boring. And I think that's, it's a statement in favor of John Carpenter. It's a statement in favor of you guys. Uh, Thanks for being my friends. Thanks for doing this with me. And I know tonight's not actually Halloween, but thanks for spending Halloween with me. No, thanks. Thanks for having me on, man. Uh, I got to say you two, you know, you're two of my best friends and you've influenced so much of like my film taste and like the stuff that you've turned me on to. So the fact that, you know, we, we know each other and can have these conversations. I, I still enjoy it so much. And I'm, I'm glad you guys have this podcast and hopefully I can return. Yeah. I was going to say, I, I was going to say, you know, we've, we've talked about almost since the beginning about having you on. And I think, uh, I think a, a special appearance might need to become a little bit more regular, maybe like, yeah, I'd uh, love to have you. Yeah, I think uh, I think I think you're definitely uh, deserving of a place on a movie podcast, uh, Casey. So, um, hey man, I'll come on anytime you want. So. You're always welcome back, man. As far as I'm concerned, I, fuck, I don't care what Devin says. As far as I'm concerned, you can come back. <laughs> well, thank you. Not what that Taskmaster Devin says. <laughs> no, you guys, you know your shit when it comes to movies, and I swear to God, both of you guys, like you guys, are role models on on how to be a dude too. Two of the best men I literally know on this planet, soulfully. So I thank you for that. And uh, I'm very grateful to, to have your guys' friendship continuing. And I'm very grateful to have uh, what audience we have at this point. For anybody that sat through this, <laughs> we've had a lot of fun. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter under Den of Sin or Den of Sin Podcast if you want to refine the search there. If you want to listen to us, you can search for us on Spotify, Buzzsprout, Amazon, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and uh, we've even got a YouTube channel now. Uh, the YouTube, usually, just because it takes a little bit longer to process the video to go along with our voices so that you don't have to see our faces, uh, <laughs> which I'm doing y'all a favor. Uh, it, it does you take me a, a favor, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, regardless, it does take a little bit longer to get it onto YouTube than it does to continuously get it on all these podcast services. So usually check for our YouTube episode about a day or two after it drops uh, an audio only in other places. But we are expanding. We're getting more likes and comments on our uh, social media. I appreciate you all for that. Let's keep the dialogue up. Let's, uh, in fact, let's only get it better. And uh, let us know what you thought about our John Carpenter special. Let us know what your favorite John Carpenter special uh, movie is. Uh, I would say mention anything that we didn't catch, but I think we literally caught everything, save for some scripts that he wrote and some TV. 
just wait till I share this episode and you're going to get five more listeners easy. <laughs> <laughs> and I am very grateful to have those five uh, new listeners. Uh, I, I, I got high clout in this town. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I've always uh, boasted, hey, I brought my parents in. My parents listen. So, <laughs> uh, and, and you're somebody. There you go. Was, you're I can't, I can't even promise that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, on that note, at this though, point, I don't know how anybody I know wants to hear me on another podcast. So, I mean, if I bring in one listener, you guys are lucky. So, <laughs> says the guy who has like four other podcasts out there. That's what I'm saying. Like, uh, nobody wants to hear me anymore. N- nobody in my actual life wants to hear me in the first place, <laughs> let alone talk shit about dumb movies for <laughs> eight hours a week. So, but, anyways, uh, but it was a but I love you guys, and this on. was amazing. Yeah, and, man, uh, love you guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming in, Casey. And uh, one more shout out. Do you want to give our uh, the website for your lamp? Uh, yeah, uh, come check us out on uh, at www.voltagevhs.com or check out our videos of our stuff at uh, on Instagram at Voltage VHS Lamps. Uh, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter at Voltage VHS. But yeah, we uh, we we love doing these lamps. And the thing that people don't know, if I could just say something really quick is that um, most components in a VHS tape aren't recyclable. So the fact that it's like a kitschy, like, you know, kind of a, God, what's the word? Uh, (laughs) Nostalgic. Thank you. Uh, (laughs) Nostalgic thing is cool, but it's also like, you know, kind of save stuff from a landfill also. So it's, it's, it's working out. Yeah, man. It's green. That's right. That's a great point, Casey. All right. Well, everybody, try to have a safe and sane Halloween. I know it's going to be a little different this year, but I'll tell you what, there is one upside. If you're not going to get any trick-or-treaters, you get to keep all the candy to yourself. So That's right. We'll see you guys. Watch in- Carpenter films. Exactly. Yes, you yes. can stay in and watch some scary movies. That sounds like heaven to me, actually. So uh, on that note, have a good night, everybody, and we'll see you next time.